Amen and amen. Thank God Jesus is alive because he lives, we live. Because he lives, we'll never die. We'll just be translated to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And what a great truth from the word of God. What a great victory that we have. We're living from victory to victory. We have victory in this world over, over sin, death, and hell. Uh, when, I, when I die, I'm going to be going to heaven uh, where I'll live with my Savior forever and ever. Sin doesn't have to dominate in my life. And uh, I can live for God, live in this world, have, uh, have the power uh, to overcome sin. Though we'll never be perfect, but sin doesn't have to rule us. And so I'm thankful for the ministry of Mountain Avenue Baptist Church, thankful for the ministry of Calvary Christian School, all the missionaries that we support across the world, preaching the gospel and teaching people that Jesus Christ is alive. And because He lives, we do live. And though these days are difficult and seem to be getting a little bit more difficult as we're quarantined and, and people are getting a, a little restless, very restless in parts of the country, and parts of the country are starting to open back up where the, where the pandemic hasn't uh, quite uh, impacted that area as much. And uh, so we're thankful for that, thankful that many churches across the Midwest and the South are opening up. Some are opening up at 25 people a limit of 25, some a limit of 50 people. Um, as Brother Mike said, we're going to have the drive-in service here next Sunday. That'll be an exciting time. Uh, you'll stay in your cars, wear your mask. And uh, you know, we, we are setting up steps uh, by God's grace to start and open up uh, Mountain Avenue Baptist Church again. We're not quite sure. I'm probably several weeks away from that. Uh, the governor did mention on Friday that there are some things that are going to be opening up uh, in, day, in days, not, he said, uh, months, uh, last week at his press conference. And I think he uh, must have got a lot of uh, criticism from that because he changed his tune. He said some things are going to be opening up uh, in a matter of days. But I believe the church, we're going to open up again probably uh, by mid-June and uh, be able to start having some services here. It'll be different. It won't be full-fledged serving with the choir and everything. We'll have probably uh, several services, smaller crowds, but we'll be back in the house of God. I welcome you to the house of God this morning by way of Facebook and, and uh, YouTube, and I trust that, uh, uh, that you're in the Word of God daily, walking with God, looking to God, and thanking God for His many many blessings that he bestows upon us, and taking time during these difficult days to let God work. Uh, God always, God always takes the bad and works it for good. All things work together for good. For those that love God, those are called according to his purpose, and so he will make things and take things and, uh, and work them for our good as we live. It doesn't mean they are good but he'll work it for good. And so we look forward to many different things, uh, events coming up this summer. We may have to do some on Zoom. Uh, as Brother Mike mentioned, we do a men's uh, prayer meeting now on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. I had a good number of men out this past uh, Saturday, and uh, Brother Bob Pollan was, joined us um, from uh, Pomona, uh, or the Pasadena areas where he lives. And uh, we're just thankful for him and Sue, and thankful for those of you that are joining us this morning around, around the country, um, and uh, we're thankful that you're here, and we know that God has great things in store for you. The best of your life is yet to come. I don't care how old you are, um, the best is yet to come, and uh, God's blessings. Now, when I say the best is yet to come, everything good is work. If you get a new car, you got to take care of it. You got to clean it out. You got to take care of it. Um, if you have a family and you add, you, God gives you more children, you have to raise them. You have to take care of them. If God gives you more money, you get a, you get a raise at work, you have to be a good steward of that money. What are you going to do with it? And how are you going to spend it? Are you going to invest it in eternity? Are you going to take some time and save money? 
uh, so that uh, you'll have money later on for your retirement and uh, to leave an inheritance to your children. Miss so many things. Everything in life that's good takes work and will be work. And I've, I've often said, and say it every year, this is going to be the best year ever in Mountain Avenue Baptist in Calvary Christian School. But what that means, it's going to be more work. If it's the best year ever, there's going to be a lot to do and uh, a, lot, a lot to accomplish for the glory of God. There's no, there's no greater joy than accomplishing things for the glory of God. God gives you a job, you do a good job at it, you get, uh, you get promoted. And uh, we do everything uh, as unto God and not unto men. And so we're thankful for that. I'm thankful for the ministry of Mountain Avenue Baptist Church. I'm thankful for the children's ministry, the bus ministry. Um, we can bring boys and girls in on our bus, our vans, and bring them to church where they can learn about Jesus Christ, learn about God. Um, I, spent, I did my, uh, my regular trip a couple days a week uh, to McDonald's, and the young lady that works the window there was saved here years ago, about two or three years ago, and, uh, and uh, get a chance to see her. Everywhere I go, just about every store, you know, different places, I see people that have been impacted by this church, this school, this ministry. And so many of them are young people. They have their whole lives ahead of them. And you see, church, it's the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, is, they're always after the young people. Because the young people, they, they kind of drive the economy. They're the future spenders. If you get a, if you get a young person hooked on alcohol, he's going to drink his whole life. Older people, you know, um, people are maybe drinking for three or four more years. If they've been drinking their whole life, they're going to probably die premature. And so the attack is on the young people. The attack is on those that are, have young minds. And they're, they're just making a decision of how they're going to live their life and who they're going to live it for. And I'm so thankful that I had a mom and dad that took me to church and uh, pointed me towards Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that I had a wife that joined with me in pointing my children, our five daughters, to Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I miss her so much. I, I was up at her grave yesterday and, and just uh, pondering the life. And it just days go on and things move forward. I'm thankful for my mom, who was a wonderful Christian lady, my mom, who was a hard worker, Mother's Day coming up. But she taught me as a young boy to love Jesus. I remember walking in by her bedroom one day, and she was on her knees. And she was praying, and I heard these words. I pray that, God, that you'll use Richard for your glory. I heard her pray that, and I've never forgotten that day. And... Uh, at the age of 15, I was saved, March 12, 1972. So I had to decide, who am I going to live for? From age 15 to age 19, I love sports. You know that. I talk about it a lot. But I, man, I love sports. I worked hard at it. I wasn't the best, but I pro probably, there's probably very few people in the state of Michigan from the time from 1972 until I graduated from high school in 1975. I mean, I played basketball probably uh, six, seven, eight hours a day. In the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening. I love sports. And so uh, I'm thankful for it because I believe it kept me out of trouble. It's that time when you don't have anything to do that Satan wants to get kids involved in drugs and alcohol and sex and different things that they shouldn't be involved with until they're married, until they, uh, for, for marital relationships, and just get past those years where they can be tempted to party and live it up. And, uh, and so I'm thankful for a good mom, I'm thankful for a good wife, I'm thankful for a godly people that just kept me point, helped me 
to point my children and, uh, and uh, ministry-wise influence hundreds of people by God's grace through this book, just teaching this book to people. It's not me. It's not a pastor. It's, a, it's, it's people that take the Word of God and deliver it to you. I'm thankful for the Christian schools that my children attended. I'm thankful for the Sunday school teachers my children had and taught them the Bible, taught them to love God, taught them to live for God. Now let me say, when you come to a point in your life where you have to have faith, you have to believe, the foundation that you have will be important. I think of Daniel and Megan Nieder, their little boy, Micah, died. And they've been posting things on Facebook. And uh, what they have to do, and it's just by the grace of God that they're getting up this morning. Their hearts are broken. And they miss their son. And though they have other children, they miss their little boy. But you see, their faith in God and God alone is, is, is the only thing that can carry them through this unbelievable grief, unbelievable sorrow, and not understanding. Listen, when my wife died, there's things I, I just didn't understand about it. I still don't. But what I focus on and I don't dwell upon are the things that I don't understand. The things I do understand is that God loves me. Jesus died for me. He rose again the third day. He is alive. My wife's in heaven. I'll join her there one day. Little Micah's in heaven. And so you and I have a life to live, and we know that God wants us to live it for His glory. And so as I move forward in my life, I'm looking for people, and I'm thankful for the church. I miss you. I miss, I'm, I'm standing here in the auditorium. I know where you normally sit. I know the you, those of you that are normally late. You know, you'd be coming in a little bit late. And, uh, and uh, I, we're all creatures of habit. And uh, I, I'm just thankful for you. And I know we're going to march forward. The army of God. Living for God. Overcoming the difficulties of our life, but it'll be because of God, because of the Holy Spirit, because of His great love. And He loves you today. Young people, He loves you. If you attend Calvary Christian School, that's great. If you don't, you know, you have a public school that you attend, then you ought to, you know, be a light there. By the way, be a light in Calvary Christian School too. Or whatever school you attend, from wherever you're watching, be a light for Jesus Christ. Take a stand for Jesus Christ. And be different from this world. Stand out. I mean, you want to be a standout. When you're on a football team, you want to be a standout. When you're practicing basketball, you want to be a standout. You want to work hard. Uh, we're watching this uh, documentary about the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. I mean, he just had, God gifted him with a talent and ability. But Michael Jordan worked hard. He's the first one there. He's the last one to leave. I was talking about Scottie Pippen, and, and Scotty said, yeah, Michael taught me to stay after practice and work on some things. It wasn't just the fact that he was talented, but he worked hard. He wanted to win so bad. He wanted to be the best so bad. He wanted, to be, he wanted to be like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. He wanted to be in the elite group. And uh, this morning as we gather around this word here and you're in your home, we want to be an elite group of Christians. We want to be faithful to God through the good times and through the bad. We want to be able to stand and, uh, and to, above all, to stand for Jesus Christ and to stand firm in this world. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Trying to destroy the young people. Trying to destroy you, Dad, when you have the most influence on your teenager. Live the Christian life. Don't send your children to church. You go to church. You lead them. 
You love them and lead them. You should never send your children to church. By the way, there should never be... Listen, if you have children, the decision to go to church is one decision. We're going every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We're going to go to camp. You don't get a choice whether you go to teen camp. You know, you don't get... Our kids never had a choice. They were going. And our daughter Tara, when we moved here, she didn't want to go to Ironwood camp. My wife went with her. She spent the week up there with her. Tara went to camp with the girls, and my, my wife stayed in a camp in a, in a cabin with other parents. And so we had that. We had the, they were. She was kind of timid about that. When they went to college, most of them went, we we told them where to go to college. And I'm thankful. They went to a Christian college. And Angela met a Christian man. He goes to church. He loves God, Josh. Laura met a Christian man, Jason. He's a Christian man. He bring the, bring the children to church. Now, now, Joanna faltered a little bit, but you know, we got Mike, but that's okay. We'll take it. You know what I'm saying? But he, he loves God. He's involved with the work of God. And I'm thankful. But we led them. We pointed them. We directed them. And that's what you need to do. Now listen, to be in a shepherd is not an easy job. It's an all-night job. Shepherding your family. And it never stops when they, uh, you know, when they get older. You take care of them. You love them. You lead them. And you point them in the right direction. In Daniel chapter 3... Our text for this morning, we find the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, their trip in here into the fiery furnace. But I want you to give you the background here as we get into this. If you go back to chapter 1, you find that King Nebuchadnezzar, they had taken uh, the nation of Israel into captivity. And he says, listen... Send to Jerusalem and bring me, bring me the best kids that are there. Bring me the sharpest kids. Bring me the, the sons and daughters of princesses and, and, and the, 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 the elite people, the smart kids. Bring them here. And I want to teach them our ways. I want to teach them and we're going to use them. We're going to teach them our ways. We're going to teach them to serve our gods. And let me tell you, this morning, as we get into this message, that's what the devil wants to do. Just because your child is in Calvary Christian school doesn't mean it's okay. Just because they went to a Christian college like many of our kids do, you have to pray a hedge round about them. You have to encourage them. You have to challenge them. You have to keep track of them. You've got to see you're shepherding a... When do, when do I stop being the shepherd of the flock? The under-shepherd. I'm trying to guide the people of Mountain Avenue Baptist Church to love God, love their families, husbands to love their wives, wives to love their husbands, children to obey their parents, and then children to honor their parents throughout life and live according to the scriptures, not according to this world. This world says a man and a man, woman and woman. God says man and woman. That's the home. The world says life, you could, it's the woman's choice to take the life of the baby. No, it's, it's God's choice. God gives life. Ladies have miscarriages and they're horrible things. They're sad. So sad. But God is the giver of life. And so we look to God. In our world, they say it's the woman's choice to, to, to abort the baby. And now they're aborting in later, later semesters and later on in the, the, in the pregnancy. It's sad. But we live for God. We follow God. God is the giver of life. God directs our days. God directs our path. And we're teaching the young people you know, to say that the church is non-essential, how can that be? The church, listen, ladies and gentlemen, they took God out of the public school. They took the Ten Commandments. They want to take it down. Now they want to take us out of church. 
Now we're doing it and because we want to protect you from getting a disease. But to say we're not essential in Home Depot is that offends me. It offends me to say that Walmart's essential in the church of Jesus Christ, the Mountain Avenue Baptist Church and gospel preaching churches like this, all across this city, all across California, all across this country and around the world are, are not as essential as a gas station, well, I, I'm offended by that because it is essential. And uh, we need to know and understand it. Your children, your young people need the Bible. And so when we get back, when it's time to get back into church, you need to get them into church. And, uh, and so we, we cry out, and we should. And uh, I'm offended by the, the church being called non-essential, and I should be. But what offends me is that when people can go to church, they don't go to church. So you say it's non-essential in your life. And it's sad because it is essential. It's not my word, it's God's word. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so my prayer is this, if you're listening on Facebook or on YouTube, that when, when you can actually, when this church is going to reopen, it's going to be back full storm again. We're going to have this choir, we're going to have the congregation, we're going to have our our Sunday school open, we're going to have master's clubs running again. But will it be essential to you? Will it be a great part of your life? It's my life. This is my life. This is what God, by the way, it's all of our lives. It's God's plan. It's God's word. And he's preparing a place for us. And I enjoy, listen, I enjoy watching the sports, I enjoy the, the NBA playoffs, I enjoy all that goes on. When it comes back on, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to go to an Angels game, try to go to a Dodgers game. Uh, I love sports, you know that. I love uh, the entertainment, I love going to the beach and, and being on the beach and uh, just listening to the water and look at the power of God's creation. And... Uh, Things are going to reopen. But what's really going to be essential? What's essential to you? What's most important to you? And I pray that during these days, when you're tested, that we, I like that little uh, the Mother's Day video that we, we were able to show. Because people are being tested at home. Their kids, their kids are there. Everybody's homeschooling. And uh, it's not, not an easy thing. I think one of the greatest promotions of this pandemic has been the, the school teacher because parents are understanding, wow, this is a lot of work. And they're only doing a fraction of what the teacher does in the classroom. And I'm thankful for our teachers. I'm thankful for the ministry of uh, our Sunday school and our teachers, our children's church ministry. Listen, while we're in here, they're back there in the children's church. And somebody's teaching them the Bible teaching them the Word of God, teaching them to obey, love, and respect their parents and their teachers at school. And so, the next generation, the, the students and the children, and the, uh, the children that we all are, have, are raising and grandchildren for me, they are the future. We have all these homes coming in here. That's the future. Listen, we're going to, the next 10 years of the Mountain Avenue Baptist Church are going to be the greatest in the history of this church. Because it's going to grow, this area is going to grow. This church is going to grow. Because we're going to go. We're going to go tell them about Jesus. And God has his remnant. Don't, it, it's not by a mistake that God has this church here and our school here and 7,000 new homes coming in over the next 10 years. It's not a mistake by from God has a plan, and it's His plan. And so here we have in, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Daniel is there, and Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Daniel interprets, tells them the dream. Can you imagine that? Think about if you had, if somebody could tell you the dream that you had and then tell you, interpret it for you. That's what Daniel does, and the king is flabbergasted. He said, nobody could do this. 
You're a man of God. You told me what, my, what I dreamed. Not only that, you told me, gave me the interpretation of it. By the way, that Nebuchadnezzar's dreams impacts us all the way into the, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was an exciting time. And so Daniel um, is promoted by God. The verse 38 of chapter number 2 says, then the, then the king made, David, made Daniel a great man and gave him many gifts and made him ruver, ruver, ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And the chief of the governors and of all the wise men of Babylon, I mean, David's promote, I mean, Daniel's promoted. God has promoted him. God's given him this wisdom, and the king promotes him. In verse 49 of chapter 2, then, then Daniel requested of the king that he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. All right, Daniel was made a great man by the king. Then uh, Daniel uh, promotes, uh, asks the king to promote Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then, after all that, the king, he... He creates an, an idol. He builds a statue. And he, he commands everybody to bow down to that statue when the music begins. In chapter 3 and verse 5, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up, and whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall be in the same hour cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the music, the Bible says here the nations and the languages, they all fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. But wait a minute, there's some that didn't bow. Everybody bowed. But look at uh, verse 11, And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth, him shall be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. They have position. You've set them over them, king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... They represent you, king, but they're not bowing down. They're not worshiping the idol and the gods that you've set up. O oh, king, have, they, they haven't regarded thee. They serve not the gods, nor worship the golden um, statue which you have play, uh, made, the, the golden image. They're not doing it. The Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. I mean, he's mad. He's upset. He's, his anger is so great. And so they bring them before the king. And uh, verse number 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? Is it true? Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you don't... Do ye not serve my gods? No worship the golden image that I have set up? I mean, he's mad. He's looking right at him. Now if ye be ready at which time to come, ye hear the sound of the cornet and all the kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. You know, you're going to do this. But if ye don't, if you don't, you'll be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They, they answered in a respectful way. They were respectful. But they said this in a respectful way. In verse 17, 
If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. God is able to deliver us from the burning, burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we shall not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. It doesn't matter. We're not going to worship. God is able to do it, to deliver us. But if he doesn't, O king, we're not going to worship the golden image that you have set up. They made it clear to the king. And so Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, the Bible says, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, he had, he had elevated them. He had given the position that Daniel had requested. And so he was, he was just saying, in a kind of in a, in a, in a, in a firm way, but now he's, he's, he's just showing hate in his face, man. He, he hates these boys. He hates them. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven, one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. I mean, just turn it up. Turn up the heat. Let me tell you something. When you take a stand for God, the heat will always be turned up. When you're doing right and you're following God, it, it'll get more difficult many times. It gets more difficult. You see, there was a test. There was the test of the trial. This, this thing's hitting Shadrach, Meshach. These are good people. Let me tell you something. Good people go through trials. Good people go through tests, testings in their lives. The Bible says in John 16, 33, when we talk about the life of the believer, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so in the world, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have problems. The longer you live, the more you experience, the more chances that you know, you're going to experience some trials and tribulation. Job 14.1, Job said it as man is born of a, that is born of a woman is born of a few days and full of trouble. Days are troubling. Now I'm talking about not only for, for people that are wicked and ungodly, but people that are good. I read all the time about people that are good. Dave McCoy, one of the finest men you'll ever meet, has leukemia. He's going through the fiery trial of leukemia. Tom Farrell. We used to take kids, listen, we used to take children, our teenagers, from Michigan. It was a 14-hour drive in a bus. And you know what buses are like at churches. We never made it past Ohio, and it was nothing worse than getting stuck in Ohio around those Buckeyes, you know. And uh, we'd break down every time we went. But you know what? We had to register our kids before Christmas. Before Christmas, we'd have between 50 and 60 teenagers signed up to go to camp that summer because they wanted to hear Tom Farrell preach. It, went out, it wasn't about the camp. It was about the preacher. It was about the man of God. That's what it was all about. Some of you parents think, well, my kids don't like to go to camp. because It's not because of the facility. It's because of the, their faith will grow because of the preaching of the Word of God. Well, the food's not good. Who cares about the food? You know, send a bunch of snacks with them. I mean, but your kids ought to go to a good... Buy. Listen, we have the Joshua camps here. They, some of the greatest men of God that walk upon this earth are there at that camp. And your, your student gets to, gets to be there with them and hear them. It'd be like you getting to, sending your child to a, a basketball camp where Michael Jordan and, uh, you know, uh, LeBron James are teaching. Stephon, Stephon Curry. <coughs> and just a hand. Listen, if you want them to be the best basketball player, you send them to the best places where they can learn. 
but there's nothing better than helping your student learn how to be a good son, a good daughter, a good husband, a good wife one day, a good mom, a good, a good father. And that's what they learn at camp. They learn how to live biblically. And so it's important that you get them to camp. But that's what Job said. Man, is, listen, it's tough. Ecclesiastes 2.23 um, again, as the scripture says, uh, for in all his days are sorrows and travail and grief. Yea, in his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. And so the three young Hebrew boys are cast into the fire. The Bible says that they brought the best men um, and commanded, verse 20 it says, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army. I mean, these are the Navy SEALs. These are the best of the best in the Marines. These are the Green Beret, you know, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Hebrew boys. Probably not the greatest athletes. Well, maybe they could have been, I'm not sure. But three Hebrew, you got the mightiest men you have to cast them into the fiery furnace. And so these men, verse 21, these, the, then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's commandment was so urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Can you imagine you got these? I don't know. There's got to be one for each of them. One to open the door. One to just, so there's probably five or six of the greatest soldiers. They open that furnace up and they cast these Hebrew boys in. And because of the heat is so strong, they all perish. Maybe six of your best men, who knows, die right there. Throwing these, because they won't bow to his God. Nebuchadnezzar throws them in to the furnace. And verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the, of, of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was a stony, and he rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, Yes, true, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. It's Jesus. He's in the fire with them. He takes off, the, he, looses, he looses their, the, they were bound up and they're thrown in. He, he Cuts them loose. And they're just walking around in there. Talking to Jesus. It's amazing. I talked to uh, Dwayne Carr yesterday. He's, he's got this big neck brace on. He's in the intensive care up at Loma Linda Hospital. And I'm telling you, he's like, well, you, nobody can come see me because of the coronavirus. But he said, I have Jesus with me. And you know what? Jesus is up there with him. And those of you that are shut in, you're by yourself, Jesus is with you. And you're suffering, you're lonely, and you have difficulty, your heart's broken, you can't come to church, but I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is with you. And He's watching over you. And He loves you. Oh, let me tell you, they're walking around in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, came near to the mouth of the Bible, burning fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Boy, his tune changed. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. I mean, those boys went in bound. They, they went in bound to be burned. And they came out burning bright as ever for the glory of God. And the Bible says they came forth thither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth from the midst of the fire. 
and the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was the hair of their head singed, neither their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. The king said this, that you're not going to touch him. And let me tell you something. Nobody, nobody can touch you without God allowing it to. And anything that happens to us, God will work it out for his good. I don't care what trial you're facing, God is with you today. These were good boys, good young men. They were thrown into the fiery furnace for taking a stand. And I can't say because you're good that you're not going to go through some things. That you would never get cancer. That you'd never have a trial. Maybe you wouldn't never lose your job. But, but I'm telling you, if you lose your job, God will give you another job and it will be better. So don't fret. It's kind of hard. We're stuck at home. But we have Jesus. He's with you. He'll meet your need. Guide your young people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'd learned long before this, this event happened that they're going to follow God. You're teaching these children in children's church and Calvary Christian School to follow God. So one day they make a decision to follow God. When you're not around, they'll just do what's right. And this morning, as you've watched this service, I'm telling you, the God that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire if the fiery furnace has delivered you from a place called hell through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus went through hell when he died upon that cross. He suffered and bled for me that I might have eternal life and that you might have eternal life. And so, this morning, as we conclude this time, if you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, you need to trust Jesus. He'll deliver you out of hell. He'll give you eternal hope, eternal life, and it'll be yours forever. If you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, bow, bow your heads with me right there in your living room or where you're, wherever you're at and pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I'd be lost without you. I'm asking you now to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sin and give me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Oh, let me tell you, Jesus loves you. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to get some information into your hand to help you better understand all that God has for you. There's a place online there that you can uh, fill out a card, make a comment. You can call the church here. We'd love to follow up with you and help you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving your tithes and your offerings. Remember, you can give online. There's instructions there. And also to mail your tithe check in to, uh, to the church. Thank you, church, for your faithfulness and giving. God has met our needs, and we continue to move forward. We're still supporting all of our missionaries. They're getting their, their, their support checks, and I'm just thankful. We know that God gives to us so that we can give faithfully. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Don't forget the service this evening at 5.30. Come on by. We'd like to see you. We won't be able to shake hands with you or anything, but we can wave and just like to see your faces. I certainly love you, and I'm thankful for you. Have a great day. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.